Hi, everyone. Welcome to another Maine SDDC webinar. We're coming in from the waiting room. We are very lucky today to have our business advisor from CEI, Peter Pacconi. Uh, and we are going to be going over the checklist for starting a home-based business today. So it'll be all of the things that go along with starting a business, but specifically from your home. So sounds like nationwide, but specifically in Maine, there have been more startups in the last year than <laughs> historically. Uh, and so this is a, a good topic for everybody. And the fact that many people were staying home the whole time was a, a blessing and a curse. So this may have come across a lot of people's minds this year. So uh, we are excited to also have two guest speakers who have some experience with this and they'll get introduced a little bit later on. Uh, please utilize the chat feature below to submit any questions you have along the way and also introduce yourself. Let us know maybe where you're from or what business you're in. Um, I don't think I did. So I am Kelsey and I am with the Maine Small Business Development Centers. And we are here to help with any small business needs you might have. So if you are not already set up with a business advisor, keep an eye out for my follow-up email after today's presentation, which will include a link to the recording as well as the slides and all of our contact information. So if you wanna request some free confidential business advising, we are here to help. Um, please stay muted throughout the presentation. Um, However, there will be time for Q&A at the end, and we may ask you to unmute yourself uh, at that point to ask any questions. But otherwise, I think we are ready to get started, and I'll pass it over to Peter. Super. Hey, Kelsey, thank you for starting this out and for your help to get this presentation off. But um, I'd like to thank everyone that joined us this afternoon. This will be a, a pretty quick ride on my part, but I'm looking forward to telling you all about how to start a home-based business in Maine here specifically um, a little bit. So this is something that's near and dear to my heart. Um, we moved to Maine probably just a couple of years ago from the West Coast and, and I had my own business on the West Coast. So um, when I moved to Maine, one of the things that occurred to me was everyone had a gig or a side gig, I called it. So hence the quotes at the bottom here, side gig to big gig, right? So Mainers always have a side gig. You know, they're doing something, but they're doing wood on the side or, hey, they're doing snow plow stuff on the weekends or hey I, I wait tables part-time so one thing that I love about Maine is their self-starters and they're highly entrepreneurial um, and they're very resilient so without further ado we're going to move forward a little bit let me go through just a little bit of housekeeping to start um, this is being recorded um, but the nice thing about it is I'm going to go through a lot of resources so I'm going to give you a lot of options um, so you'll get a copy of this. It'll be on the YouTube site, but also you'll have a one pager sent to you that'll have all the clickable links for you. Um, again, please keep yourself on mute. Um, if you do have questions, which I hope you do, go ahead, put them in the chat and we'll answer them at the end. If there's some burning question that Kelsey feels like we need to do, she will stop me. And then she'll say, Peter, let's answer this question. This seems to make sense while you're talking about that. So thank you for your, your support on that part of it. A little bit about myself. I've told you a little bit. I'm a West Coaster, moved to Maine a couple of years ago, um, but I'm basically an SBDC business advisor, and I and I work out of the Waterville office in Waterville, Maine. It's housed in the Chamber of Commerce. A little bit about my business background. I'm actually a biologist by trade. I did that for almost 12 years, and then I had a, obviously a passion for the outdoors, um, and I started my own business. I was an entrepreneur. I got into fly fishing retail. I was a captain, had two boats, had a full retail store, 3,000 square feet, four employees, internet site with five or 6,000 products. I grew that from zero to uh, over $600,000 in sales. That was over almost 15 years. So that's part of where I come from. I got into business organically. My family had a, a small business growing up. So that's where I come from a little bit. Um, hence, that's why the picture shows me with the striper. This is a striper right from Camden here. Um, I am on the coast. That's where I live. We do a lot of our meetings virtual for the FC, SBDC now because of COVID. Um, we can meet you in person, but the bulk of our meetings um, are virtual right now. It's a little bit about myself. 
Let me tell you, we have two great guests today. And these are people that I've known some more, some longer than others, but they're both business owners. One's more recent, one's five or six years in, but I'd like to thank Tony Small and Sean Manch for joining us today. The format for Tate is I'm gonna give you about 30 minutes of telling you about how to start your homemade business, some of those rules and regs. And then after that, you're gonna, we're gonna ask a couple of questions of these two business owners so that they can give you their perspective. And you're welcome to ask questions to them directly also. So thank you to Tony and Sean for joining us. Um, let's keep moving. First of all, I'm gonna back up a little bit because I want to let you know about the SBDC, which is Small Business Development Centers. It's a state entity that's funded by the feds. So this is your tax dollars coming back to you. So this, this is what we do. Um, but the SBDC basically has free business advising. I'm saying free. You've paid for it in your taxes, so it's coming back to you. But it gives it to any business and entrepreneurs, startups, it doesn't matter. And we can cover you nuts to bolts. There's business planning. We can do startups. There's fiscal advising. There's financial analysis. We can talk to you about your credit. Even if you have bad credit, like want to start a business, we can help you there. There's how to get into your marketing. Let's say you have a current business. And it seems to be making okay money, but you want to go further. This is another place where we can help. So soup to nuts, the SBDC has a team of advisors that can help you. So again, been there, done that. And there's over, Kelsey, and forgive me, but I think there's over 12 or 13 different advisors throughout the state across some different support entities. Um, and we've done this with this for since 1977. Obviously, I haven't been there since 1977. I'd be a little bit older, but we have a team on board um, with host organizations that has a tremendous skill set. So I encourage you to use us when it makes sense and tell your friends about us. Okay, a little disclaimer, the SBDC, we're business advising. So one thing we can't do, we can't provide any sort of tax, legal, or accounting advice, direct advice. So I'm going to talk to you about some legal stuff today, but in general, as soon as you have to make that decision, we're going to ask you to go seek an accountant, seek an attorney, or talk to someone that is an expert in that field. We have a lot of expertise across a lot of sectors, but ultimately you need to get that advice from, from someone that you're paying. There's a disclaimer. Let's keep going. So what are we doing today? What's the purpose of the webinar? You have a good idea, but really it's home-based business. How does it work? Um, the first thing we're going to talk about from a high level, what's it like to be an entrepreneur? What does that guy look like? Is he good? Is he bad? Does he stay up late at night? Like, how does it work? And then secondarily, what is your thing? What is your side gig that you want to turn into a big gig? You know, like, what is your gig economy, right? How does that work? So we want to know if this is your gig, these are the permits, these are the licenses you're going to have to get. Then we're going to look at your entity. How do you form that? What informs you in that process? How does it work? Um, we're also going to look at the state permits and the local regulations, how that's different and the best way to source documents for that and best practices getting into your community, which rolls into social license. That's a big term for us. How do I integrate with my community? And then looking at employees. This is always a thing that people struggle with. At least I did when I had my business. We're going to look at resale certificates and insurance. And then at the end, we're going to get perspectives from, from two startups, Tony and Sean. All right. So what I'd like to do is just get a sense of who's in the room. And I want to see where you as a consumer is at or you as a, as a potential business owner. So what I'm going to do is Kelsey's going to start a poll and the poll is going to ask you this. And this poll will be right on Zoom. So you can click right on it in your Zoom screen. So the question we're going to ask this group is where are you in the business development process? Where are you at? Are you, I want to start a business, but don't know what type yet. I have an idea, but it's not clearly defined. Or I have an idea, but I'm really not sure how to launch it. Or I have an informal business, but now I want to formalize it. Or last but not least, I've got a side gig that I have confidence can be a full-time gig. So I'm going to let Kelsey start the poll. I love watching the answers just start to pour in. This is the best part. 
if you have like an most issue, people, yeah. yeah, most people have voted at this point. And, and should you have an issue with the poll or, or actually clicking on something and it's not working, put it in the chat and Kelsey can help you. I'm just going to wait just a little bit more time. It's neat to see what's coming up. We have a tie. This is kind of like a horse race right now. We've got a tie for, we have a tie for first here. Um, good. We've got eight out of 10. And should you not see an answer there? That's okay. Put it in the chat. Like say, hey, my answer is not there. This is where I'm at. So go ahead and put that answer in the chat and tell us. And then Kelsey can tell us what's going on. Kelsey, just so you know, I'm not looking at the chat while I'm presenting. All right. Well, it doesn't but it, seem like anyone has answered in the chat, but it is okay. still a tie. Okay. So, by the way, thank you um, for putting, giving us your feedback. So right now, what we're looking at is we have at least kind of the rooms evenly split up between they have an idea but not try to launch it, or they've got a side gig that could be a full-time gig. But there's another percentage, which is interesting. They have an informal business and now they want to formalize it. And equally, someone has an idea, but they're just not sure how to put definition around that concept. So this is fascinating to me that, that we actually have, it's a perfectly even. This way I expected to have it go all the way across the spectrum. So this helps me as I present because I can, I can see where the emphasis is the room is. So all of you have an idea. Right, or something that's already in space. Kelsey, thank you. That's perfect. Good. There we go. Okay. So, again, thank you for giving us that feedback. Um, we're going to keep going. Okay. So, first, let's start out with why start a business? This gives you tremendous opportunity. You can start to create your own destiny. You can make a difference in your community. When they see you out at five in the morning doing snow plowing in your community, guess what? They're gonna look up to you and respect you. So there's all sorts of things that come out of that. Your profits can be more, right? You're gonna be making more money. And guess what? It comes right back to you. There's no employer in the way because you are the employer. You contribute to your society and your community in a way that's impactful. And there's a respect that comes with that. And like myself, you're gonna enjoy the heck out of what you do, hopefully, because you've chosen it and you're gonna have fun doing it. So what does it take to start a business? But more so, who is that person? What does he look like to be an entrepreneur? How does it work? Um, one of the things we ask in some of our advising is say, hey, are you a self-starter? Are you the guy that, 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 that actually doesn't call somebody to fix the dryer? They go on YouTube and try to fix it themselves, right? You're that DIY person, you're a self-starter. That's one of the attributes, right? Do you plan and do you organize well? Just so you know, I was not a good organizer. So you don't have to have that skill set. But I want to let you know what I did is I tried to surround myself with people that can help me be more organized. But I was a better planner. Uh, you get along with different personalities. This is a big part of what we do. But your job or your business may not require you. You might be in a truck pushing snow, right? Or you might be selling logs, right? selling wood to people. You don't have to be the, the super outgoing, forward-facing person. Are you good at making decisions? Some of us are better than others. I know this was a skill set that, that I grew into. Um, do you have the physical and emotional stamina to run a business? How does that work? Um, and building on that is the family, right? Some of you might have a family-based business or something where they're integrated. And like, does that work with your marriage and all the other things that come with that? And then can you create the network to help you? This, believe it or not, is last but not least is the most important part. I'm going to talk more about that network as we move on because the team around you is what you build it. You're a sole entrepreneur. You have to build that network. And it starts with a business advisor like myself or someone at the SBDC. So some things you might want to think about before we go down the road, right? There is a chance that you might lose some income, right? Just because you're, it's only up to you. For example, if you're in the restaurant business in the last year, COVID closed down your business for X amount of months, right? You could not have people come in. So you shifted to online sales, but still you would have lost a lot of revenue. It's a thing. You have a risk of losing your investment, right? Or maybe other people that have invested in you. Um, the hours and the hard work can be significant. There are, can be high levels of stress based on what you're doing. There's responsibility. And if you 
like that form and that works for you, it sits squarely on your shoulders. Discouragement is part of the deal. And I see this as, hey, you've got something that's in your way. You have to learn to navigate around it. Some people see that as discouragement. I, I just see that as adapt and improvise, move around that. Um, and a lot of times, if you don't have a, a gig already that you're working on and you have a full-time job, you probably for the first year will take a lot less money than you want. So if you have kids and family members, you have to create a support network around them. I got this uh, image from one of the other advisors when I was talking to him about doing this webinar. And this made so much sense to me because a lot of times in life, guess what? You get to that point and you feel a little bit stuck and it feels scary, but that's the best time to make the jump, right? Otherwise, guess what? You get stuck there. You're staying in that same place your whole life. But I'm gonna caution you, before you make the jump, talk to somebody first, get some references. So where do you start? You've got your idea. Some of you have ideas. Some of you already have an existing business and want to make it full. Even if you have an existing business, put it down on paper, build a business plan. A business plan is a, a formal way to say, I'm going to build a roadmap so that someone can understand where I'm going. We all know what a roadmap does, right? It gives you from A to B and it tells you, I'm going to stop at this restaurant. I'm going to stop at this gas and I'm going to go through down these freeways and I'm going to avoid this kind of traffic. So your business plan just says, this is who I am. This is what I'm doing. Those are my products and services. This is how I'm going to sell my products. This is how I'm going to market them. Here's how it's going to work. The operational side, right? Here's how I'm going to sell my oysters or here's how I'm going to do my gigs. And then you're going to talk about your management team. And also you're going to build in some financial stuff. You're going to say, hey, when I get 40 customers, I'm set for life, but I'm going to need 10 to get through the first year. That's your fiscal plan. One thing I want to call out, because we're talking about home-based businesses, there's a little bit of a rabbit hole here, because if you're starting a home-based business and it's food-based, there's certain things that I won't mention here you're going to have to do with the state, because should you have a kitchen at your home, you've got to have, an, have the inspector come and do that. So I'm calling that out now that I'm not going to go down the food-based role for this, but if you're doing something like that, feel free to follow up with someone at the SBDC in your region to understand what that looks like. Okay, you've got the idea, you want to formalize it. What does the entity look like? What you're going to ask yourself is, what does my ownership look like? And why do I want to do it that way, right? So the ownership entity type has to facilitate what you do and your business goals. So you, your goal may be to, hey, I just want to build a business on the side, maybe give it to my son, or you know what, I want to take this, this business, I want to franchise it in six locations, so I mean, and then I want to sell it or I want to corporatize, right? So the entity you choose has to support that, right? And then what are the requirements for that entity, right? If it's, um, if it's a corporation, a lot of requirements. If it's a sole proprietorship, you fill out one form, you're good to go. And then also, how does the, what are the tax implications of making that entity? So let's go down the road a little bit and look at what are the main types of entities. There's actually more than this, but these are the main categories. Number one, sole proprietorship. You already know what that is because you see it day in, day out. You're people that own the business and they are the, they are the business. Um, there's certain things that have a partnership. That makes sense to you on paper. Two people come together and they form a partnership to start something. There's a limited liability partnership. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that because I think that's important for you to understand. And then there's a limited liability company. This portion of it is probably one of the most common parts. And then there's a corporation. I'm going to spend the least amount of time there because most of us in the room are not there yet. So sole proprietorship, also known as a DBA. I'll talk, a DBA is doing business as. Sole proprietorships are super simple to form. You literally have to fill out one form, get it to the state, get it to your local entity. These are inexpensive. Um, that income comes right to you and it's easy to dissolve. You just tell people, I dissolved it. You can tell the state you did that. Some of the disadvantages of a sole proprietorship, if there's any issue with the business or there's debt or there's a suit or something or someone's upset and they, wanted, and they want to get what they need out of your business, your assets are in play. That's your home, that's whatever is on you as an entity. So you, Tony business owner, all your assets are in play. So this is a little, you can have things that are on the line for you. 
A lot of times sole proprietorships have more difficulty funding. Banks look at them as a little riskier. Um, if you have employees, they like things that are a little bit bigger because sole proprietorships can come and go in the blink of an eye. Um, and there is no difference between you and your business. So your assets are in play. Let's look at the, oops, there we go. Let's look at the partnership. This is super common, right? Let's say you and your friends say, we're gonna start a cupcake factory, right? We're gonna do it at our home. We're gonna sell cupcakes to all the local bakers. Perfect partnership. They're easy like a sole proprietorship. You have shared financial responsibility. So you can both put money in but you're gonna make sure you have to share all that money, right? This partnership can be an incentive for employees. You can pull them into the partnership later on. It's flexible that way. So you can have an employee that's phenomenal at sales. You can pull them in and let them be part of what you're doing. Um, some of the disadvantages, um, there's joint and individual liability. If you do have a disagreement and you can't come to some sort of conclusion on that and how that works, it can stall things in a significant way. And the profits are now shared. So. If you're doing the bulk of the work and your partner is probably doing less than that, that's a portion where you need to understand how that's gonna work. Here's a limited liability partnership. Um, how does that work? A really good example, um, my family, when they were um, early on in, in our career, we built in a limited liability partnership. We wanna start a business, but we needed financial injection. So we had four friends that gave us money to be part of that entity, but they had no say other than they're gonna put their money in, they could take it out, they could get dividends from it, they could get as the business grew, or if we sold the business, they would reap those rewards, but they're almost like silent partners. But this is very much like a partnership, um, but they're only liable for what they put in and they can't have any direct control, right? And that partner can transfer ownership based on an agreement with the owner. So this works really well when you have people that wanna help you move, but don't really wanna be involved that much. So a limited liability company is the single or most um, common form of an entity, right? Especially for startups. And the main reason why is because there's limited liability. So your personal assets in general are not in play. Right? It's a hybrid between a sole proprietorship, a partnership and a corporation. So it has all those benefits with, all, with almost none of the drawbacks. Um, there are some things you have to do, right? You have to register the state. You have to have some articles of organization. So there's some paperwork to do here, but it's probably the lowest in terms of the threshold ability. Um, but there is the, the biggest benefit for this is there's the lowest threshold for personal liability for any members. Advantages, all the benefits, right? There's a lot less record keeping. There's a lot less paperwork. There's fewer restrictions on profit sharing. Um, again, super popular. Um, there And there are some drawbacks to this. Some of the LLCs in, in certain states have a limited lifetime in the sense that they have to be reset or restarted. Self-employment taxes can be a huge part of that. Um, certain professionals, like if you're a doctor, you can't be just an LLC. You have to be what's called a PLLC, which is a professional LLC, which requires that form to actually have liability insurance and doctor should, or an attorney. So um, as an LLC, because you have such little liability, people sometimes are less likely to invest because you just, you have less invested in the game. So corporation, don't hear about this very often. These are S corps and C corps are the two main types. Um, these are great if you're getting bigger, you have many partners. There's um, the owners can be separate from their legal liability, um, like debt. Believe it or not, they, you can sell stock in your company. Um, you can get more capital because a lot of investment people understand this this entity well, right? Um, there's well defined roles. It's very clear what's happening. Um, Drawback here is they're super time consuming. There's a lot of paperwork. No one's gonna do this on their own. You're gonna have to pay an attorney. There's filing fees every year. Someone has to do your taxes every year. They're gonna have to build this into your stuff. You're easily gonna spend two or three times what anyone else would. Let's move on to what I call social license. What does that mean? That's basically to say, 
how do you integrate into the local culture or that community, right? Do you have a license? You know how when you get a driver's license, when they say, do you have a license now to drive? This is your license to interact well in your community, right? It's called social license. What does that mean? Are you a good neighbor, right? Are you someone people can count on? Are you a good partner in the space? Are you what we call a good actor? Um, let's look at what that might look like. That little guy on the right is your neighbor because as soon as you start a home-based business, this is what they do. They poke their head through the leaves and they look at you and be like, okay, why did you put a dog kennel next to my home, right? May not be the best thing to do, right? Let's say you want to do a dog kennel and you're on five acres, that's good. But if you're in a smaller community, may not be the best choice for you. So knowing your neighbors and their predilections, what they're about, it's number one, right? Be a good actor in the space. Consider investing time in your community. Be a part of it before you make this decision so you, you can understand where your local folks literally live socially. Like, what are they like? Are they registered Democrats? Are they registered Republicans? It's a good way to understand where people lean before you start something like that. If joining things in town works really well, consider aligning your business to what's happening locally. It's very common because um, you can get better sales out of that. If you're on the select board already for a local town, guess what? There's your marketing right there. You're already integrated. You can, you can put your social license investments into your marketing plan. One of the biggest social licensings you have to have is with your family, right? If you're married and have a family, your wife's got to be on board. The kids, they might be part of the deal. They might be splitting wood with you on the side. They might be helping you out, right? Get that team on board because they are now part of your team. Whether, whether you like it or not, you're operating out of your home. So they are now on the team, right? And then if they're part of the team, how do they build the team? Is there operational stuff that they do? What are their duties? Make it make it clear to your wife you're only going to do things between eight and five or hey i'm going to be snow plowing from four in the morning till or whatever hour that storm comes in so make sure they're on the team by becoming clear in your obligations to your home business and their obligations so you're going to have a name of course right and most sole proprietorships they've just put it in their own name this is Peter Pacconi investing, right? That's easy enough to do. But the first thing you want to do is look and see if that name is taken in Maine. There's a link here for the state site. Go right to that site. Again, all these links will be shared with you in a document we're going to send right to you. So don't worry about writing this down. Um, you can go to that link and you can type your name in and search it, right? And then if that's good, you can register it with the state, get your paperwork, and then you can do what's called a DBA, doing business as with your local entity. So whatever town you're in, you're going to go get it there. And you can talk to the, the county office and they'll let you know where to get that paperwork. There's a resource called Business Answers. I'm going to highlight that here in just a sec. Um, okay. Maybe you're not sure, like, you know, I've got this business, but do I need a state license? I don't even know. I have a bakery. What's the state require? There is a phenomenal resource out there called Business Answers. Um, it's under the main department of community development. And it's what's called their one-stop licensing center. It's super simple, easy to get to. Um, I'm going to show you what it looks like. So when you click on that link that you're going to get at the end of this webinar, this is what it looks like when you go to the site. And you'll see on the top right here, it says, I want to. You can either start a business in Maine, and it'll go through determining what you're going to need. Or I'm like, I already have a business. I'm a bakery. What permits do I need? You can search for a specific permit for your business. They have a number, which is phenomenal. You can call them. Be aware with COVID, you know, people are, are time is at a premium and actually there's less people working now. So the state itself probably has some limitations here, but you can always send them an email also. Okay. We've looked at the state, right? What do they need? Um, let's look at the local rules. If you're in a small town, this is actually Camden. This is part of where I live. And Camden has its own select board. They have their own town office. Um, and if I want to start my own business here, I'd contact the local town office or, there's, or the city hall. And then I would, I would call them and say, hey, I'm starting this business. What document do I have to let you know on? Some towns are so small, they don't even have a website and they send you the document, old school. Some towns have a website. You can go get it from the website. Um, one thing they're going to say is, What's your business? What are you doing? They'll tell you the people to go touch base with. Usually, let's say you have a salon 
and you're building that salon on the backside of your house, right? And now they're gonna have you meet with the local code enforcement officer so they know that building is up to speed. It's not gonna start a fire, right? The fire department can come expect it, inspect it if they need to. Okay, employees. This is the bane of certain businesses, right? Certain businesses, Walmart's got more than they can shake a stick at. But if you're a restaurant, guess what? You're gonna have to have this stuff. So let me just, from a high level, give you a sense of what you're gonna need. So the business owner, first thing you're gonna do is get your EIN. It's your federal employer identification number. That number gets you into the system. You can't have that number. It's like a passport to get into the federal system. Then you're gonna to come to the main state income tax and withholding and register with them. That's gonna give you your state registration for tax and it's gonna register you for unemployment insurance. At the same time, you're gonna get your workers' compensation insurance and you're gonna go find out where to get your posters, your labor poster. You've probably seen them in the back of restaurants or some businesses put them out front. They tell the employees, these are the laws at the state and federal level. This is what you're entitled to. Um, there's actually a website that does this. You can order them and they're all laminated already. From an employee point of view, the things they're gonna have to do is they're gonna have a withholding certificate. It's called the W-4. They're gonna fill that out. You're gonna keep that on file. And then they're also gonna have an I-9 form, which is their employment el eligibility verification form. They're gonna fill that out, get that back to you, and you'll do your process with those forms. You're also, when you get a new employee, you're gonna report them to the Department of Health and Human Services, and you're gonna complete, you're gonna keep all these documents on file somewhere. So what if you're doing a taxable service? What if you have a product um, that you have to create taxes on? So the next thing you're gonna do is get a sales tax number. So you're gonna to go to the state and you get a tax registration with the main revenue services. There's the link there to go get it. It's really simple. You can, you can do the application online or you can download it and send it in. I encourage you to do it online. It'll be a lot faster. Um, if you are reselling things and you're a wholesaler buying things at cost and then marking them up and selling them at retail, um, you can apply for your resale certificate. I wanna warn you, these things take 30 to 60 days to happen. So don't expect this to, you're like, hey, I'm gonna start tomorrow. Give yourself a little bit of runway to start. And then last but not least um, is insurance. Obviously, this is not hard to do. You can contact your local insurance agency. I encourage you to do that. I got my insurance the first time from a national agency. What I realized was it was much more fun and was better fit for me to work with someone locally because when I did have an issue, I could call them down the block and they would come meet with me. So I'm gonna encourage you to use a local vendor if that's the best fit for your business. So, that satisfies kind of the high level view of what it takes to start a home-based business. What I wanna do now is transition out to this part of the webinar where we're gonna hear from our business owners. I wanna special thanks again to Tony and Sean for subbing in here and giving us their perspective. Just a little bit of background. I've been business advising for, I don't know, six to 10 years here. And I've worked with Sean for less than a year, but I've worked with Tony for probably close to four or five at this point. So I have experience with both of them, but they're gonna give you their perspectives from their startups. Sean has, or um, Tony has two businesses. She has a yoga studio and then, and then she has an aquaculture farm doing oysters. Sean is a professional musician with a side gig where he's doing a recording studio at his home. So um, they've done some significant work. I wanna give a kudos to them. And again, thanks for their feedback today. Um, but we're gonna ask them one question to start, just to help them give feedback. So the question we're gonna to ask Tony to start is how did you make the decision to go into business, number one? And Tony, feel free to give us a little background on how you started your business and some history, um, which is basically how did you know it was time? And then also talk about your greatest challenge and your greatest success. Tony, you might have to unmute. I, yep, I just did. Hi, everyone. Um, so this is really fun. So a little background. I actually feel like I really have four gigs <laughs> that um, kind of dovetail. So my primary income gigs um, 
I am a yoga instructor. I was also a Zumba Gold instructor until the pandemic hit. And um, I actually have recently gone from being out in the world teaching to bringing that home. So I'm speaking to you from a little space off the back of my garage that I have renovated in the last year to be able to teach online um, and to stay teaching online because I discovered I loved it. Um, I also have an oyster farm with my husband, John, and he is a former lobsterman and still goes deep sea fishing for uh, North Atlantic bluefin tuna. And I actually, one of the things about the way I started, I had been um, moved here, kind of had, was landing, trying to figure out what to do. And I ended up working with a small landscaping firm on the St. George Peninsula where I live. And I kind of loved it, but I also, it wasn't all the things that I wanted to be doing, but it gave me an opportunity to um, kind of just begin my own business. And I, I really, I hadn't considered being a business owner. Um, I had worked for nonprofits. I had worked for other people. Um, it just hadn't really come across my radar, but I, I think I was interested in it because I kept taking classes like this where it was like, what do you have to do to be a small business? Um, and so I began this, this business that I worked for started um, firing their clients, essentially. They were going through a shift. They wanted to change their priority. And so a number of their employees were like, well, I'll take the maintenance for this, this, and this garden. So I did that simultaneously. So I had about 13 gardens that I cared for. And then I was also just teaching a couple of classes, but I realized I really wanted to be teaching more. And so one of the things that I, um, I think happened organically was I segued from one thing into another, but I use, I still use the gardens as like supplemental income. It's my side gig now. Um, but then when I met my husband about a year later, a friend of mine said, you guys should think about growing oysters. So about five years ago, we started that. And that was the same thing where he was still fishing. Um, I'm still teaching and gardening, but then we're beginning to weave this in. And one of the things that I love about Maine and having a home business is the way in which you can actually have, like, I like having multiple things that kind of create a seasonality to the year. And so I know that like coming around in spring, I've got gardens and oysters coming up. And then summer, there's a little lull where things are just kind of doing their thing. Oysters are growing and maybe I get a little rest before a really crazy busy fall. And now oysters are actually busy in the winter. So I, um, it, it's been really kind of fun to play with having a variety of things. Um, the oysters came online, as I said, through the recommendation of a friend, and it's a very slow growth, literally, um, process before you really kind of hit that moment where you're like, okay, now I'm, I'm really generating income. And I would say that's been the, probably one of the greatest challenges in, in terms of trusting, um, trusting the ebb and flow. So on the one hand, I say, I love it. <laughs> on the other hand, I it's not all roses. Like it's not all easy peasy. Like there have been times where I'm like, oh, this is a little tricky. How am I gonna get through to the next season? So one of the challenges is then kind of creating um, the rhythm, right? So we get the, the benefit of being able to create our own work lives. And then the challenge is making sure you're gonna meet your bottom line throughout the year and how you're gonna do that. Um, so I very organically, I also am a black and white photographer and periodically I will sell a big print for some money. And at this point that feels like bonus. Um, but I will say this, that my, and, and I guess maybe one of my greatest successes then is being nimble and sort of using my network. Peter mentioned that as a, as a top, um, piece for entrepreneurs is that my network actually is very interconnected. So my, the gardens I still maintain are neighbors who give us access to their land to get to our oyster farm. The phot photographs I sell are about my local community. The yoga classes I provide are for people who love my oysters. Like, it, and it doesn't have to be that way, but it just, it, there's sort of a natural overlap so that when I found the people I enjoy working with, the nice thing is that there's actually some continuum. So 
John will catch a bluefin tuna. I'll put out an email to my oyster, to my yoga list. Hey, we've got bluefin tuna for sale. And boom, it sells. Like, so there's this funny um, synchronicity between each of the things I do. Um, but I do think that's actually been probably one of my greatest successes is figuring out how to ride or surf that a little bit between, between the, the skills I have to offer this community. And now bringing my yoga home, I actually have an opportunity that I've not had before to begin offering product globally or nationally. Um, and I do a teacher training. So I have actually had international students in this online platform. So that's changed just in the last 15 months, um, like so many. So I'm, I'm trying to meet, meet what is obviously a demand with something with a skill I have. Is that enough, Peter? Does that give you some? Tony, that's great. Thank you. On? Yeah, thank you. That was really helpful to share. Thank you. Um, that was perfect. Give a really good background. And I honestly forgot how many different things you were doing. <laughs> I didn't realize about the vegetable stuff. I, that was well before me, I think. But thank you again. Um, please put any questions in the chat for now. But what I'd like yeah. to do is move on to Sean. And just Sean, I've only known, believe it or not, for the last couple of months. He's a new client of mine for business advising for the SBDC. And so he's a more recent startup. And his story is phenomenal to me because he's very young and he's pulled it together and he's making these decisions to set up his business in a way that's significant and it's early on. So I love working with people early on because I can save them so many places where it's challenging for them. Um, and, and, and then Sean's, Sean's format is also multi-level, right? He has kind of one business that he's doing, but he has different levels to it. So um, let me let Sean tell you more about what he's doing. Sean, go ahead, take it away. Yes, thank you, Peter, I appreciate it. Uh, so yeah, I'm Sean, welcome. And um, yeah, basically I wanted to do what I love. Um, I wanted to take what I love doing, playing music and recording and just turn that into what I can do to pay my bills and uh, enjoy what I do every day. Um, I've been a web developer for about 15 years, just kind of freelance. And I'm using the studio and web developing, and live performance, all kind of in one, uh, just to do what I love. I don't have as much to say as Tony, um, it's hard to follow with all that, you know, she's been doing it for a little bit longer, but, um, yeah, just working, you know, nine to five jobs and stuff like that wasn't right for me. I was just kind of tired of doing that. I didn't want to live the same, uh, generic kind of life that's been lived. I wanted to take a little bit of adventure and just bite the bullet and go into business. Um, I'd say the biggest challenge was just kind of making that jump. Um, you know, performing and playing music, it took a lot of confidence to kind of believe that that could be a business. Um, but then doing that, you know, I saw the opportunity with the pandemic ending and people uh, wanting the live music again. Uh, so it just seemed like the right time. Super. Hey, Sean, tell us more. Can you tell us more about you have a couple different things you do. So you're you're actually doing gigs at night, right? And then on yep. the side you're doing what other things are you doing? So that's where I implemented the web developing uh, and recording. Mm -hmm. um, just whereas I'm an independent musician and I record myself already, uh, I figured I had the skill and the equipment so I could also do that. Um, I have people that want me to just take lyrics and make a full song out of it. Mm -hmm. um, and a, a lot of different services like that, basically anyone that needs audio recording um, and implementing that with the websites, you know, it's kind of all in one people that are trying to get out there as musicians doing what I'm doing. Um, that's who I want to help. Just basically help the little guy uh, get out there from the experience that I've had. Mm -hmm. And then they can record any music they want to do right there in your studio. Yep. Fantastic. Or like people, so like my most recent client, they just, uh, just a songwriter. So they know that I sing, play all the instruments. So they, have just the lyrics and I'm writing that for them or if someone has you know their own instruments and they want to record it so it's fun to kind of like I said be fluid and adventure with the different possibilities mm, super. that's what's fun about it yeah yeah super um hey Sean can I share one more thing I want to tell them parts of your story about yeah. how you got started and you bought the land and built the house is that okay if I share some of that yeah I appreciate it yeah so one of the things that impressed me 
about people that start their own businesses. They always have a vision and they have their wherewithal inside. They have this drive or they have the guts, I guess, for lack, and, and they've got that fortitude, I guess, to do that. So Sean went out and bought a piece of land that was undeveloped, right? And then he lived on it in like a tent and then built a home that he was going to live in, like a tiny home, like a tiny house, correct, Sean? Yes, yeah. So Eight by so, 16 feet. So it was definitely a tiny house. So talk about vision and, and like wherewithal going, hey, I'm going to do this. But he bought the land, then paid that off, and then built the home that he lived in, and then built on to that as he builds his business out. So this, to me, is a true form of entrepreneurship when you're literally building your own home to sleep in, right? Exactly. Yeah, that, it's, that's definitely been a fun part of the adventure. Um, and, you know, just kind of doing it all myself like that, it's given me the freedom to be able to, mm -hmm. you know, take on starting my own business. Yeah. So I'd say that's definitely the, the foundation for it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and for, for this audience, don't feel like you have to go out and do that. So, but make it work for you. So when you do have your idea, make the idea work for you. Like you're like, hey, I'm not going outdoors. I'm not building my own house, but I'm going to get support. So that's where you build the team, right? I want to head back to that part of this conversation because you're going to feel like you have to do these things on your own. You do not have to do that. But what you do have to do is reach out to people like SBDC advisors, maybe people in your family, maybe bank managers, maybe marketing people, reach out to your local chamber of commerce, reach out to that, these people, and then start to slowly pull in your network. And that makes your business seem much easier. For example, I had a client that literally was challenged financially. So she just reached out to her bank and asked for financial help and then talked to an SBDC advisor. Another one was looking at how to better market her business, right? How does that work? So she went on and took a webinar for how to, how to put your business on Google, right? These are on the SBDC YouTube site. Actually, make sure you go check out the SBDC YouTube site. It has more of the greatest videos and they're done by advisors just like myself. And they're on topics that like you wanna do, like how to network your business, how to do search engine op optimization for your website, right? And it's soup to nuts type things. And it's been there for numerous years. So there's a lot of different topics um, that you can get into. Hey, Sean, what's been your greatest success so, so far? Um, I would say the fact that I was able to get, um, you know, fully booked, get basically clients up until the end of the year. That was mm -hmm. a major success to me. Uh, the fact that I have consistent, you know, work starting my own business. And I wanted to mention, um, that the SBDC has been such a huge help too. I didn't really know anything about trying to start a business or anything like that. I just, you know, saw the online form. So I'm definitely thankful for that because you guys do have, you know, great advice. Mm -hmm. Hey, what was most impactful from the SBDC? What part of that process you felt like really got you over the hump? Uh, just having someone there to ask the weird questions, the things that aren't just, you know, generic FAQs and things like that. Being able to have just someone to bounce the ideas off of, you know, is definitely a huge help. Super. Especially just being a single owner LLC, you know, it's, I don't have a partner or anything like that. So it's really just me and then trying to figure it out from there. So that's definitely a huge help. And that's basically where the jump was. You know, I decided to you know, get signed up with you guys and, you know, just kind of take it to that next level. Got yeah. it. Thank yeah. you. Hey, Tony, can I run that question by you? Do you mind like telling us wh what was most impactful for your experience with the SBDC or business advising? I would say, um, yeah, I'm glad you asked. I would say I feel like it's super helpful for me to have a partner. Um, I mean, my husband, John, and I are partners in the oyster farm. So we have like our partnership around like, okay, where do the oysters grow best? When are we going to get that work done? How much money is it going to cost? Blah, blah, blah. All that. We can kind of put our heads together. But for me in my other realms, um, I'm working solo and it can be really lonely uh, when you're trying to make business decisions or when you're trying to figure it out. And I would say, um, certainly the accountability has been really helpful just to be like, okay, this next month, I'm going to work on this. 
okay, next month I'm going to work on social media. Then I'm going to work on, you know, like having some accountability, having someone like Peter who I meet with once a month, sometimes it's a couple times a month, but just to have um, somebody there who's looking out for me and holding my feet to the fire essentially, because you are managing a lot as a solo business person. It's a ton of stuff um, to, to kind of make it run smoothly. And I'm probably managing more than I need to be, <laughs> but it also is like a sort of a rich, a rich way to have a life. So I really appreciate the accountability and, and asking the weird questions. <laughs> Super. Um, Tony and Sean, thank you so much for giving that feedback. What I want to do now is say thank you to the audience, obviously, and to this group. But if there are any questions, feel free to unmute yourself. You can ask it. Or if Kelsey has any questions in the chat. We do not currently have any questions. So if anybody wants to take the mic over, feel free. Um, I will say thank you to all of you for joining um, all of our participants, all of our viewers, all of our hosts. Uh, we love hearing that kind of feedback um, about your experience working with a business advisor. And it, it's always reassuring as someone who's starting a business, like, who are, who are these kooks? What are they selling? You know, like, are we legit? And so I love to hear, uh, see some businesses who have actually worked with us um, as it all applies to, to new businesses coming out. Um, I don't see any questions coming in, but like I said, feel free to plug those in the chat. It is almost four o'clock, so we want to be respectful of uh, our time. Uh, looks like, see, Sean, he knows how to do YouTube. He's, he knows, you know. Yeah, uh, I don't know which side it's on, but. I, everybody sees it differently, so some people are like, why is he pointing at Peter? <laughs> <laughs> hey, and I want to point out for the folks that are in our audience, that these are the links for the resources. You're gonna get this in a document, but there's a link for the main SBDC. Anything I talked about today is in the business startup checklist. That is on the SBDC site. You're gonna get this sent to you. Um, that's your lovely gift for participation. No chocolates in there, unfortunately. If you want to register for advising, it's actually done by region. Um, so there's a link to go do that. My information is right down below. There's my name, there's my email address. So feel free to reach out to me in person for any questions. Um, and then that gives us everything you're gonna need to get started. And I just wanna wish all those that are in the audience, best of luck and make sure to keep building that network. Yep, and I will send out a follow-up email probably tomorrow morning that will include a link to the recording and the slides, which will include all of those links. Um, everyone's just saying thank you in the chat. Someone said they had no idea that the SBDC existed. So this feels like a win today. Mm -hmm. uh, so good job, everybody. Uh, thank you for including me. Yeah, thank you. For thank joining. you. This was thank great. Uh, I love having extra per that per perspectives, I guess, um, and how this would work. Because it's one thing to hear someone say, these are all the things you have to do. And it's another thing to hear someone say, these are all the things I did. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, mostly just compliments coming in. I don't see any other questions. And I want to be respectful of everyone's time. So we will call it an afternoon. But thank you all so much for joining. We'll see you next time. Bye, everybody.